So, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, there's a slight change to the, to the program for the afternoon. Uh, I know that some of you are sadly disappointed that you didn't get to hear Francesco in the morning, so you get to hear him, hear him now. Um, and afterwards, I think we'll probably just try to have a discussion on some of the themes that have been uh, reoccurring throughout the conference in order to open up uh, in preparation for the final lecture of the day from Professor Novotny. Um, hopefully at this point in a, in a conference, introductions are no longer necessary, but uh, I'll, make them, I'll make them anyway. I'm Darren Meacham, by the way, for those of you <laughs> that. Um, so thank you all for, for being here, first of all. Um, but it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Francesco Tava uh, of the University of Milan, the Patochka Archives in Prague, and until very recently uh, of UWE Bristol as well. Um, I can't remember the name of your paper now. That's very embarrassing for me. <laughs> on the possibility... So the brief struggle on the possibility of a post-European community. Okay, you've so. changed it anyway, so I'm glad I didn't give the wrong, give yeah, the wrong title. Yeah, great. So it's my great, my great pleasure to introduce you. No, it's my Francesca. great pleasure to be here, to be back here. I had a great time in Bristol, so it's always happy, I'm happy to be back. Uh, yeah, I'll try to be uh, as quick as I can so, uh, so that uh, we can also start a discussion. So it's in order to wake you up, let's see. That's the purpose. So um, I'd like to start in a very concrete way, uh, recollecting uh, what uh, uh, recently um, Alexis Tsipras uh, said, indicated as uh, one of the key points of his uh, political program in view of the European election campaign. This is a sort of a recomposition because you started uh, yesterday uh, the conference. You opened the conference saying that we are so close to this election. So now we are close to the finish. and. It's good to remember also something very, really political, uh, um, uh, political present uh, uh, problem. So uh, Tsipras said, uh, you can find this quotation from his uh, website with uh, no problem, uh, indicated as a, a key point of his program the necessity to fight against the idea of a fortress Europe. I think yesterday uh, Dagman maybe uh, already quoted this idea of the fortress of, of Europe. It's a pity she's not here anymore, but uh, that's the idea. Um, so um, fight against the idea of a fortress Europe and also to conceive an inclusive idea of community. That's uh, what uh, Tsipras uh, said, uh, wrote. Well, the idea of Europe uh, as a fortress, uh, so as a closed, self-defending universe, has a long and also quite bizarre story. The phrase uh, fortress Europe was probably used for the first time during uh, World War II as a propaganda term. Curiously, both the sides of the conflict, uh, the conflict recur to the same idea, meaning with it uh, a very different phenomena, of course. In the British context, Fortress Europe was a battle honor, according to the Royal Air Force, to qualify operations against the Nazi-occupied zones uh, in the continent. From this uh, outer perspective, the fortress was something already existing that uh, was necessary to destroy. On the other hand, in, the, in the same, that same period, the Nazi propaganda dealt with the idea of a Festung Europa, the fortress of Europe, referring to Hitler's project to fortify the whole of occupied Europe. In this case, the fortress is something missing, which is uh, worth to build up. The same ambiguity can be seen also in the present. Festung Europa, for example, recently became a slogan of the Freedom Party of Austria. The idea of fortress got here a positive, projective sense. The entire slogan says, Europa muss eine Festung sein. So Europe has to be a fortress. The fortress, in this case, then does not exist yet and must be built by means of the abolition of the Schengen Agreement and the restoration of the state national borders. In a totally different sense, Fortress Europe is also the name of a well-known internet blog devoted to the phenomenon of immigration and its victims, namely to people who strive to enter the fortress, giving their lives in the try. Darren recently uh, posted in uh, his uh, post-European uh, uh, website this video, this uh, incredible, astonishing video of people trying to overcome a border, trying to enter Europe. I think that that's the best description of this very tragic and also complex phenomenon. What do you, can I make a comment? Oh yeah. Just a, what was amazing about that video, of course, is that they, they were in Quetta and Melilla. So those were European enclaves outside of Europe, actually in, in Africa. Yeah, that's another example. So um, 
the ambiguity we are seeing of this term fortress reveals its essentially inadequacy when applied to Europe, to the idea of Europe. What we mean by Europe is something more complex that cannot be conceived neither as a fully closed realm nor as a wide open space. Contemporary philosophy uh, often try to handle this complexity, trying to give uh, a definition. Jean-Luc Nancy, referring to this problem, stated that Europe is essentially a landscape of countries whose uh, multifarious representations constitute its authentic fundament. An Italian philosopher, Massimo Cacciari, in a close confrontation with Nancy and also with uh, La Culaba, referred to Europe uh, not as a continent, but uh, as an archipelago. That's the word he used uh, some years ago in a book called uh, the Archipelago, the Archipelago. Uh, so as something which is essentially plural without losing, uh, uh, nevertheless, a sense of unity as well. The difficulty to define, even geographically, the very idea of Europe reveals the fundamental permeability of this region. It's essentially dynamic character. The difficulty co consists here in determining which kind of political form would be capable of organizing the space in the respect of its complexity. Following uh, Tsipras' example, it should be asked if uh, the task of building uh, an inclusive community can be seen as a valid alternative to this idea of fortress. Defining a community as inclusive can actually sound quite pleonastic somehow. How could ever a community be exclusive? that is uh, rigidly closed on itself, rejecting the other. The same idea of common as a space of being with, according to the definition given to it by Nancy in uh, the in operative community, but also by, by Heidegger, of course, implies this character of inclusiveness. On the other hand, as Jan Patoschka noticed, already in the 50s, the European political project, as it was pursued until 20th century, can be interpreted as a try to make the community i.e. an ensemble of alterities who decide to coexist a unity. Ut omnes unum sint. This is the phrase that Patochka repeats in a, um, a work uh, from the 50s, for example. Uh, the effort to solve in a pure rational way any kind of political conflict, establishing a perfect homogeneity within society, is at the base of what Patochka called super-civilization meaning with this term a particular political confirmation originated in modern European history in which every element of difference is excluded from society or even uh, brutally erased by political power in order to preserve its univocal structure. The consequence of the elimination of every, of, uh, of every element of alterity is a sort of addiction to things. This is another phrase used by Patochka in this text. Being incapable of taking a distance from the mere reality in which he lives, the individual seems totally lost in the mechanism he wanted to rule. In its, uh, another phrase by Patochka, in its uh, quantifiable meaninglessness. The same phenomenon was noticed already in the 40s by another philosopher, by the Spanish philosopher uh, Maria Zambrano, who dealt with, uh, and I quote, an atrocious enchaining to mere facts in order to describe the agony of Europe in 20th century. Uh, this phrase, uh, uh, The Agony of Europe, is also the title of a book uh, Zambrano wrote in the 40s during the Second World War. But Europe is also something more than this atrocious condition. It's uh, unavailable to be unanimously defined. It's a complex character, as we called it. Allows Europe and the subject who inhabits it to take a distance from this flattened structure, even in the, in the harshest situation. And I quote again from uh, uh, Zambrano's book, the genius of Europe is its, cap is its capacity to detach itself from reality. The agony of Europe consists in the struggle of the individual to maintain the last hint of this detachment that uh, uh, the, pres the present condition continuously jeopardizes. Also, Patochka's idea of post-Europe can be interpreted in these terms, namely as a theoretical effort to outline a detached perspective on Europe in order to preserve its spiritual traits, even in a situation of political crisis. As he clarifies in a well-known study uh, on this subject written in the 70s, the failure of the European philosophical and political project is already an empirical evidence. Northless, this acknowledgement does not entail a simple overcoming of Europe. 
On the contrary, the subject who engenders this post-European perspective must be capable to address a look back to European history, defining the essential relationship that bonds the present to the past. The only way that to measure uh, the depth of the abyss which divides Europe from its post consists, according to Patochka, in the desperate attempt to fill it, trying to comprehend Europe's complex meaning, envisioning its history. This is what Patochka has in mind when he deals with the necessity of a historical vision, eine geschichtliche Einsicht. This is the phrase he uses in uh, Europa und nach Europa. Uh, historical vision over Europe, explicitly recalling, uh, with this term, uh, the Husserlian notion of Einsicht. According to Patochka, an authentic historical vision has nothing to do with a positive knowledge of ideas. It is rather, and I quote, a vision over the fundamental moral relationships between progress and decline, between the possibility of freedom and its undermining. I'm quoting again from Europe and post-Europe. The only way to contrast uh, uh, what uh, Patochka called uh, addiction to things that uh, characterizes the late season of Europe consists in detaching from mere facts, which can be technically, technically measured and ruled, addressing attention to the ethical position of the individual in front of the, of the events that shatter his existence. Patochka determines in these pages an explicit analogy between a historical vision on one hand and moral vision on the other hand. And I quote again, the moral vision is nothing but a sedimentation and a codification of the experience made in history. Concretely, putting into practice this historical vision entails looking back and gathering to an upper level all the elements that characterize human history and prehistory. Dealing with phenomenon of myth, with the birth of language, with the report to mortality, Patoshka shows in this essay how this post-European perspective means uh, how this post-European perspective means overcoming the flatness of the present, the limits of the immediate, looking at its hidden foundation. What does this particular moral and historical vision entail for the life of the individual who engenders it? This is the basic question I want to make today. According to Patochka, this, per this per perspective is all but peaceful. It requires indeed to openly question what a good life is. Not a mere existence whose only task would consist in satisfying immediate needs, but rather a life in which the subject decides, and I quote again, to bravely behave against the general misery, to struggle in the trenches, aiming to invert the force of gravity that affects collectivity and determines, fundament, uh, determines its flatness. This idea of courage, of a brave struggle, uh, often recurs in these pages. Another quotation to show this point. The fundamental precondition of the being good is the courage, the possibility and the will to brave a danger, which is essentially a danger of life. The presence of a danger, of a fatal risk within the moral life of an individual was underlined by Patochka already in the 50s, with reference to the idea of freedom. In several fragments about the concept of uh, negative Platonism, and I'm very happy that Daniel uh, mentioned this uh, very important subject. So in, uh, we should remember that uh, negative Platonism is, is not just one essay. Actually, it was a project uh, that Patochka had to write a much bigger book. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, he finished just this um, big essay, which is normally called the negative Platonism, but there are many other fragments uh, uh, quite um, not, not often translated, not often uh, read, actually, uh, that are the fragments uh, left uh, after he gave up with this uh, project of publication. So in one of uh, um, these fragments, uh, Patochka argued that freedom cannot be conceived as a simple property, but rather as a dangerous experience in which the, the subject is put in front of a, vi of a vital decision. A quotation from this fragment, uh, whose name is uh, uh, The Problem of Truth from the Perspective of Negative Platonism. Uh, freedom, writes uh, uh, Patochka, means risk, incessant possibility of mistake and necessity to decide. Freedom means harshness of contradictions, necessity to take a decision on them, as if we can control them, and indicates at the same time the impossibility of this control. 
Freedom means therefore angst in front of the apparent emptiness in which man with his marginal position is settled. According to Patochka, only through this sacrifice, this exposition to his own mortality, the human being can experiment his freedom, only reaching, also reaching that moral vision we were referring to. This uh, courageous behavior, however, also hides a risk if, if the subject who engenders it do not have a clear acknowledgement of the gravity of his situation. The post-European individual who is willing to engage this brave struggle is not comparable to the figure of a titanic hero who, because of the exceptional nature of his praxis, can simply, de can simply detach himself from his world experience. In this case, according to Patochka, the moral action would decrease to a sort of pseudo-heroism. The dangerous trait here consists in the capacity of this individual to take a distance from reality in virtue of the post that characterizes his position, but always maintaining his fundamental vision, his fundamental Einsicht towards the world. That does not allow him to easily abandon it. The nature of this vision is hardly seizable. Only a gifted person, says Patochka, a person particularly subtle and perseverant will be able to realize this uh, hazardous venture, this Wagnis, uh, says Patochka, which consists in envisioning the world and its history without being simply reduced to its mechanism, but escaping its quantifiable meaninglessness, raising a retrospective fold that shatters the homogeneity of European tradition. Patochka tried in many occasions to give a further explanation of this existential position. In a few other fragments he wrote uh, on uh, post-Europe, he referred to the idea, originally conceived by Henri Bergson, of open souls, often Zelen, to define these individuals, recollecting a concept he already dealt with in 1970, speaking about Comenius. In a seminar he held in uh, uh, 1975, he used the phrase spiritual man, which also recurs in Europe and post-Europe. In both these texts, Patochka particularly underlined the character of active exposition of the subject, also mentioning the, the political outcome of this praxis, in view of the birth of a new common. He says, eine neue Gemeinde, or eine neue Gemeinwesen, of a new form of community founded by spiritual men on the platonic principle of the care for the soul. This conception does not correspond to any spiritualistic drift. I remember when I defended my doctoral dissertation, the first question, they, no, the second question they made me was, uh, well, but Patochka is a, spiritual, is a spiritualist, uh, has nothing to do with a political real life. This is the second question. The first one was, well, did you learn Czech to translate Patochka? Why? <laughs> so just to remember a tragic <laughs> moment in my life. But you did. Yeah, well, and, uh, well, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let me speak about the, that moment and what I actually answered. <laughs> anyway, um, this conception does not correspond to any spiritualistic drift, I was saying. On the contrary, as Patochka clarifies, Plato never understood the care for the soul as a matter of uh, the isolated individual who keeps aside from the common field. On the contrary, only taking into account the soul of the community it will become possible to reach the soul of the, of the individual who moves in it, in a problematic and conflictual way. The essence of the Socratic lesson, as it emerges both in the Apology and in the Republic, can be detected, can be detected according to Patochka, in this complex analogy between individual soul and common soul. And I quote again, looking at the common, it becomes possible to learn the structure of our own soul and to know the entire movement it enabled. On the other hand, the reformation of the community has to follow an orientation of our own soul towards the common whole. Once the necessity to project the care for the soul to the community is finally recognized, it becomes necessary to understand what this relationship between individual and common may entail. As we have already seen, the kind of soul that Patochka has in mind is what he calls an open soul the open soul of the spiritual man, i.e. a soul who openly experiments its absolute otherness, the existence of something, of, of something that overcomes its limited situation, becoming those, those aware of its detached existence, of the fallacy of human pretension to completely frame a world, as if it was put at its own disposal. So the question is, what kind of impact can this brave exposition have 
if we conceive it not only as an individual perspective, but as the fundament of a renewed community. Roughly speaking, I will be quite direct in order to uh, make it short, a community built on this base will be a community that will give up the same idea of identity, conceived as a closed and impermeable unity, unable to face the conflicts that characterize any intersubjective space. And here I come very close to the conclusion of Anya's talk, of course. And it's funny because uh, Anya um, very correctly quoted uh, uh, Roberto Esposito. And we were, as, as we were mm, saying at lunch, actually Esposito uh, in uh, the early 90s, I think, edited a book called uh, uh, Beyond the Politic about uh, this idea of politics and of uh, the possible overcoming of the classical idea of community as well. And uh, among the essays he included in uh, this uh, book, he included also the essay, the seminar by Patushka from 1975 that I just quoted, the one about the spiritual man. So I think that uh, we are incredibly close in all the things we said until now. So it's a good uh, reason to, to go on. Um, it will be a community, this kind of a community without soul or uh, without uh, identity or beyond identity, capable of envisioning the otherness to which it, es it essentially opens, without an intention to reduce it to any sort of unity. It is a community essentially influenced by an active tension. This is another phrase that Padochka often uses in this essay, active tension. As well as our soul is influenced by its tumos. Padochka also recalls this uh, platonic idea in this context which, according to Plato, corresponds to the median part of the soul, the space, Patochka says, of the conflict in ourselves, the component that aggressively defends our same authenticity, not closing ourselves up, but on the contrary, engaging us in a dangerous and courageous movement towards the other, through the overcoming of, this, of our single and limited existence. As Patrick points out, applying the idea of Tumos on uh, a communitarian space involves a harsh contradiction. How could something be at the same time an element of safeguard and an element of division, an element of defense and an element of conflict as well? The essence of this new community, according to Patrick, consists in maintaining both these elements, facing this contradiction as well as the spiritual man must be capable of concealing intellectual distance and courageous involvement, detachment and responsibility. In order to better understand the nature of this resistant force within the polis as it emerges in these last pages of uh, Europe and post-Europe, namely as a chance to, for the rise of a new communitarian principle, it is useful to recollect uh, the figure of Antigonus to whom Patochka dedicated a well-known essay in the late 60s. In this essay, Patochka describes the rationalistic attitude of man, represented by Creon, as a try to stay on the surface of existence, striving to simply float on it. This attitude involves an effort to hide our own weaknesses, to shrink from what in life looks dark, ambiguous, dangerous, in a word, the otherness, as we understood it before. This behavior does not uh, prevent the human being uh, to be exposed to the risks that uh, threaten his existence. Despite all his tries to dismiss these obscure and deep forces, they will always stay dangerously close to, the, to his everyday life, ready to burst into it. The political power aims to avoid this risk, and therefore it, its fundamental task consists in building more and more safe shields. As part of this idea of immunity is absolutely seizable. In, uh, in this position. According to Patochka, Antigonus represents a figure who openly, openly contrasts this trend, undertaking a totally different action, directed to the depth that man tries to avoid, whose last expression is death. I was trying to read again Antigonus uh, some days ago, uh, right in this paper, and uh, uh, for uh, uh, the whole tragedy, the chorus always repeats the same objective, same predicate uh, to Antigone. She's intractable. You are intractable, Antigonus. You are intractable. So that means that you are because you are not willing to be bring back into normality. That's his ethical position. During her uh, clash against Creon, who represents the inflexible defender of the law, of the polis, we can say also of fortress Europe in this case, Antigonus continuously recalls this plan of depth. 
Maria Zambrano, and I'm glad to quote her for the second time in this talk, uh, wrote also a book about Antigonus. And uh, in order to define this difference between Creon and Antigonus, uh, uh, say that uh, if a Creon was characterized because of the fact that he always wanted for his entire life to be the same thing, that is the king, Antigonus was many things. She was sister, she was woman, she was mother, she was a uh, sister, she, was, uh, she, was, she represented uh, all these uh, uh, different and uh, this complex uh, uh, ensemble of uh, characters. So Antigone continuously recalls his plan of death, and the Patoshka, in commenting this position, says, Antigonus firmly replies to him, so to Creon, there this laws does not count, there the human existence has no sense. The human sense has no sense, sorry. The human sense stops at the threshold of death and of night. Envisioning this absolute otherness, Antigonus reveals to humanity how the world in which it lives is neither autonomous nor sufficient. His acknowledgement constitutes a danger for the police, understood as a community built on a public law, which will inevitably struggle to submit this element of discrepancy, bringing it back to normality. But Antigonus, despite her peculiar detachment, is also a member of the police. Cacciari, writing about Antigone in his book uh, The Archipelagus, uh, showed this point. If Antigone just decided to leave the polis, uh, he wouldn't be such a problematic person. He is against the law of the polis, but always part of the polis. And here we can see her also unforgivable element. She never leaves that, 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 that same public sphere that she put into question with her behavior. Her unfor unforgivable element is detectable in, the, in this will to indicate something other from the polis, sinking at the same time her roots in it. In conclusion, I think that uh, imagining post -European, a post-European inclusive community means to think at a community in which Antigonus would not be refused and buried, but rather accepted, not despite, but because of her scandalous behavior. This community should renounce the illusion to create a harmonic coexistence between individual and state, between private and public. On the contrary, it should be able to valorize its inner phenomena of conflict and resistance, giving voice to these countercurrents at the risk of its own fall as well. I stop. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can already open up to some questions for Will. Thanks. I stop you with that talk. Um, actually, just two question questions. Um, one was about the polis, and you just mentioned the end, and I wonder if, what you think about um, particularly Agamemnon's, but I believe the rent as well, think that the polis is something in the past we haven't got anymore. So when you're talking about the, which, which, we, which we've left behind with the Greeks, and somehow it may be like an incident that's gone. And I'm wondering whether you, you think, you talk about the polis, where you think the, the polis is some kind of, there, there is still a polis somewhere. Which is, which is active, and that's why you brought it up, I'm not sure of that, okay? And the second one, the second, um, the second question is about this idea of private and public, and whether, how that functions, to, because on a Gambon's, for a Gambon, the private-public blurring is precisely, a, is a biopolitical act, uh, which is very dangerous, and I wonder how, how, how that fits into maybe the topic of whatever you say. Uh, many thanks. That's a great question, and uh, it's clear that you know uh, the Italian philosophy maybe better than me, so it's, uh, it's a great thing. Well, um, actually, the two questions are linked, uh, so this idea of police and this idea of private and uh, public. Uh, I'm not sure Agamben, but uh, Cacciari for sure make, uh, makes this, uh, this uh, uh, division, this confrontation between police that represents essentially the space of public and oikos, which is the other word, uh, other Greek word, very similar, that uh, represent the private sphere of the city. So, and uh, I think that all the conflict that characterizes polis is essentially seizable in this uh, complex uh, uh, relationship between uh, this private, so this uh, oikos element, and this uh, public, this uh, uh, polis element. And the, the dream of politics was to uh, fix this conflict, so to make uh, the private perfectly public. That is also a point that Arendt, for example, uh, handled in uh, uh, the human condition. 
The point is, uh, according to this interpretation, trying to read some points of Patoshka, is that um, a community who wants to overcome this kind of idea of politics as a sort of a, a total control of reality has to conceive, not, has not to uh, hide or uh, has not to try to uh, fix this conflict, but uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, it has to uh, valorize this conflict. How? I don't know. That's a great question. But I think that uh, one uh, big uh, task of uh, political philosophy in the future is, ex is essentially to uh, deal with this uh, complex uh, link, this complex uh, relationship between public and private. Not uh, destroying it, not fixing it, but valorizing its uh, harshness as well. That's pretty, uh, yeah, that's interesting because for gambling in the second homo sapiens, the kingdom and the glory, because of the genealogy of fiscal economy, the oikos, and how the households now become the general bureaucracy, so maybe... Yeah, oikos means, uh, yeah, of course, house, yeah, originally. Yeah, exactly, and so when the theologians are arguing about the organization of God's kingdom on earth, that's, yeah. that becomes, trans somehow descends into a bureaucracy management of the world, like angelology. That's, that's interesting, that the valorization of the conflict between the two is probably something what Gavin wants to also do, like maintain their difference uh, somehow, or at least valorize their... Well, I think uh, you're right. This is exactly the problem. So, uh, yeah, absolutely, Gamban has a big role in this debate, of course. Anya? Yeah, um, I have a question. So, you brought up Antigone here, and I thought when I was listening, it struck me um, some of the feminist readings. I mean, I'm thinking of Bonnie Holly and Butler, uh, Cavadero, and I guess I think they're even put together in books. I remember reading a book on this, but I can't find it now. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that's interesting is the sort of unexplicit red thread in this book is this discussion about Socrates and Antigone. Their, their roles, in a way, as certain representations of what it is that philosophy should be or what it is that the idea, in this case, not of Europe, but a much broader idea. Um, and I'm just wondering, does Patochka also somehow bring those two figures together? Uh, yeah, well, of course, she um, widely refers to both of them. Um, in in the essay about Antigonus, I don't think she uh, um, she quotes uh, also Socrates. I'm not sure. I can ask other colleagues, but uh, in that occasion, I think that uh, the focus is all on uh, Antigonus. But I think that of course there is a link between these two kind of interpretation because uh, they both uh, share this uh, scandal position. Uh, maybe if we can also draw kind of difference, if. Uh, Socrates represents this uh, negative power still uh, in uh, a rational way, somehow, still uh, through a sort of rational dialogue. Antigone uses a kind of different force. I didn't have the time to make other quotations, but uh, Patochka in that essay, this is uh, one of the best things uh, Patochka wrote, in my opinion, says that uh, Antigone follows another kind of law that is not uh, the law of the earth, the law uh, of the of the day, but the law of the night, sort of primeval underground law. So it's a, it's a very poetic and also unclear way to describe this phenomenon, I think. But uh, um, I think it's useful to better um, shape this kind of otherness. So I think that uh, in this uh, particular way, Antigone is, is even more scandalous than Socrates with her behavior. Nicholas. Thank you. I wanted to continue this discussion about Antigone. I found it very fascinating what you're saying, but I just wanted to be clear about something. I just wanted to try to do this here. At the end, after you introduced this, this designation of Antigone as unforgivable, and then you, did you say, I just want to make sure I understood, did you say something that then what the Polish should do is accept Antigone? The police that the Polish should so should not reject Antigone but accept Antigone was that your that's yeah that's a possible conclusion so um, maybe not accept because uh, accepting her would, would mean also comprehending her and uh, well depriving her of her unforgivableness but uh, uh, at least uh, I think police could try could imagine a, a kind of relationship uh, towards Antigone that not uh, hides this unforgivable character, but that actually face it, that actually tries in a very complex way to handle it. So my question or my comment would be this, I mean, it, it's, it's, if one were to pursue this, one of course would have to begin with Hegel. Because Hegel's interpretation of Antigone 
which is almost of course. a master discourse for all, 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 all philosophical interpretation of antigone. And in, in Hegel, the problem of antigone is, is the political problem because it's about the reconciliation of the law and the individual. So universality and the particular. And then the whole problem of tragedy is the inability to reconcile this for which politics is the answer. Absolutely. Right. So, so, so sort of the basis of the political is the tragic. Um, but for, 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 for Hegel, um, the political solution to tragedy is the attempt to somehow integrate the individual, qua individual, into the community. So Zittlichkeit. Um, now what's interesting is that it would seem on what you just said that Patricia still remains within the Hegelian shadow. If the, the desiderat is to somehow conceptualize and understand the acceptability, the hospitality, however you want to call it, of Antigone as unforgivable. That might be a less radical position than Lacan, who develops an interpretation of Antigone almost in the same, you know, in 1966, yeah. Ethics of Psychoanalysis, who says actually the true way to think about Antigone, and this is the whole master discourse of truth about everyone else, is that ethics, the genuine moment of the ethical, requires social death. And what is social death? Social death is precisely the ability to accept the total renunciation of my determination by the symbolic order. Um, and that's the true moment of rupture and liberation, which is unforgivable. Yep. Um, and so it would seem that the Lacanian reading of Antigone seems to sort of be more consequent almost to the intent of Patochka than Patochka himself. <laughs> yeah, right? I agree, actually. So it's, I mean, in yeah. Lacan, that's the truly unforgivable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why ethics is ultimately psychoanalysis. Yeah, actually, Patoshka puts it uh, in a much better way than I did here, so uh, it should be useful to make many other quotations from the text, but I think, yeah, I totally agree. I think that uh, uh, maybe Patoshka is still influenced by the Hegelian interpretation in that case, but uh, I think that uh, Lacan and Patoshka somehow followed two parallel paths in this kind of interpretation. But then it would be for the question of Europe, I mean, from the Lacanian point of view, Europe will always be a kind of signifier Mm. that has to be stitched, buttonholed, into a discourse of the imaginary. I mean, there's yeah. no, there, I mean, you cannot escape that, because to escape that would be the genuine ethical moment that breaks with this fantasy of, of this discourse, right? So in a sense, it's, you cannot be ethical and European, right, for Lacan at the same time. Yeah, and you can be post-European, maybe. So that's the, the, the paradox also, the post-European position. That's what Patrick in a very complicated and also confused way sometimes trying to say so Europe is finished that's clear that's you can see that but we are still envisioning its history and we cannot avoid to do that it's a very strange situation so we are after something but not outside outside of something so it's uh, I think that the difficulty to understand what he means by post Europe is exactly in this point to conceive this very strange and uh, fragile position and also in this case, I think, I, I don't know, I should uh, read carefully that uh, part, and thanks for the suggestion to Lacan. But yeah, I think that uh, they absolutely are going to the same direction. James. Thank you. I'm just curious about why Antigone is involved in this debate about what the future citizen of Europe is. Because as far as I read the play, you know, Creon is wrong simply because he tries to extend the laws of living to the dead. I mean, Antigone just wants to bury her brothers. And her brothers, of course, were rebels against the state, but they are no longer citizens. You know, they belong to a different realm. But she is. She's still a citizen. But And a sister. Well, that may be, but she is involved. I'm just following what so Sophocles says on the face <laughs> of it, okay? I'm going to take softly at his face value, is that, you know, you don't take the laws of living and applying to the dead, and Antigone does not take the laws, you should not take the laws of the dead and screw up the poets, okay? In other words, I think it is a cautionary tale. Now, but the question is, you know, is that the model or is Socrates the model for the kind of citizen that you want? I don't see any way in which people like Antigone can be brought together, because they are just not political. Mm -hmm. I can't see a way in which 
people like Socrates, you know, who are genuinely political, can be brought together, and that's through dialogue and conversation. Yeah. And, and the dialogues show how that kind of community gets established, like in the Republic. But as I say, my difficulty is, you know, I think I just I don't think see I, her as a citizen <laughs> or a political actor. That's oh, very fine to hear the apology of Korean by James. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, <that's>, <laughs> what I think is that Antigone is absolutely political, not in the same way of uh, Antigone is. If uh, Antigone wasn't political, she could just uh, bear Barry, has br uh, her brother, and leave the city. He was not forced to make this uh, quarrel, this uh, clash against the Korean. She could just uh, do what she wanted, following her heart, he said a and then exit. Those bodies, and she just spread a little dust. Yeah. Well, I and then she started to come. argue against Creon in a public space in uh, the square about this point, about her action. So she wants to be political, and she also wants to follow another law, which is absolutely impolitical. Of course, that's the difficulty yeah, of this position. Yeah, but how do you bring people like that together? <laughs> to form a community. With the solidarity of the chicken. Remember, the point is getting a community up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I still have to understand what kind of community that could be. But uh, is there a. The individual. Anya, oh, no, sorry. Uh, Tamara, you had, your, you had your hand up for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have a question concerning the fundamental vision you mentioned. You said only gifted individuals can decide and have this fundamental vision. Here, the common criticism we have an argument of exceptionality and philosopher as king who understand. And how do you counteract this uh, accusation in this context? And is Antigone someone who understands who has this fundamental vision? No, I'm not sure I got that. Sorry. Can you rephrase I'm it? I'm asking if uh, you have an argument against the accusation of philosopher as king who understands. Mm -hmm. Because you mentioned that they have a fundamental vision that you know, everyone can have. Yeah. Yeah, Patrick says that uh, a person who is able to engender this kind of vision is a gifted and uh, also a perseverant person. But uh, yeah, I think that kind of um, uh, matter concerns this capacity of the subject to be courageous. So there's a, there's, there's a bravery of the subject to engender the difficult position. But I don't see the problem of this. So did you see a problem in this uh, problem particular? From the point of view of community, you are looking for. Why? So it, it comes back to the previous question what kind of community we have. It means a community That's a question that I absolutely no cannot answer. Yeah. <laughs> so the, real, the real tragedy is Hyman, he's caught between Creon and Antigone, you know? Mm -hmm. And, there's, and that's the failure of the community there. Maybe of the community as we imagined. I, I absolutely cannot understand uh, saying, uh, cannot just say what exactly this community, if uh, a kind of community like this could exist, of course. So uh, how this community could be. I think that this is the task. So trying to conceive uh, this uh, very particular and also paradoxical kind of community, which is um, maybe impolitical, maybe beyond politics, I don't know. But uh, I think that uh, there is a need of this community somehow, in the sense of uh, an overcoming of what we intended for community until now. Teresa? Yeah, but on that point, would it be helpful to uh, put together or to compare Apochka, idea of community as you expose it, and all the, the debate that was originated by Blanchot as saying Absolutely. on the yeah. <laughs> de Beauvais, I don't know how to translate it in English, I don't know if even there was an English translation of that. Yeah, book. yeah, there is. Uh, you know the title? Uh, mm. Unavowable. Unavowable, yeah. Thank Unavowable, you. yeah. What is it? Unavowable. The Unavowable uh, community. Unavowable. 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 Like, like Unavowable. confession, Unavowable. yeah. And, and not see, and if we can make that connection. Yeah, actually, that the, the book by Blanchot was an answer to the one by Nancy, if I'm not yeah, wrong. No, no, the, the other way around. Nancy's book was an answer to the one of Blanchot, I think. No, no. I don't think so. Okay, okay, don't check that, that. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm quite sure it's Blanchot who answered to Nancy. Okay, but anyway, that's not relevant. There's not a big problem. problem. <laughs> but if, if, if you agree with me on that point, Absolutely. then a way to make this more concrete for me and to relate it to Europe would be Balibar. Because Balibar in many articles and books 
he refers to that debate between Blanchot and Nancy, and he refers to that debate with Europe. And his answer is that we have to think a community without or without identity in a relational sense. Absolutely, yeah. That's a, a kind of thing that I should study, actually. So I, I don't know very good by bar, but uh, yeah. The, what you said uh, confirms what uh, I was thinking, that actually it's a very valuable path. Thank you. I will do it, maybe next conference. Uh, <laughs> we can discuss further. Thank you. Fran Francesco, you started with a quote from Alexis Spiras, who's in the middle of a, of a campaign, of course, for the, for the European Parliament. Uh, you ended by saying that you have no idea of what kind of community we should be, we should be talking about. Uh, I want to put forward to you four different quotations Ooh. yeah, that hopefully will uh, provoke a little bit. They're a bit coarse as well. And I, I want to just get an idea of where we stand, where you think we stand in terms of these four different, four different quotations. The first is from Husserl, yeah, from, from the Vienna lecture. He's speaking of, of Europeans. He says, I mean that we feel in spite of all the obscurity, this feeling is probably legitimate. And what is the feeling? The feeling that an entelechy is born in our European civilization, is inborn in our European civilization, which holds sway throughout all the changing shapes of Europe and accords to them the sense of a development toward an ideal shape of life as being an eternal pole. This is Husserl on Europe in the Vienna lecture, and Husserl on what he says is a feeling that almost all Europeans seem to, seem to share. Yeah? The next quote I want to give to you is from Sartre, from the preface to Wretched, Fanon's Wretched of the, of the Earth. Mm -hmm. Sartre says, when a Frenchman, for example, says to another, we're done for, which to my knowledge has happened every day since 1930, <laughs> it's a passionate discourse burning with rage and love, where the speaker puts himself in the same boat as his countrymen and then, as the rule adds, unless everybody gets the message. That's from Sartre. Sartre contrasts this to Fanon. Yeah? Quoting Fanon, Fanon says, let us not lose time in useless laments and sickening mimicry. Let us leave this Europe which never stops talking of man, yet massacres him at every one of its street corners, at every corner of the world. For centuries, it has stifled virtually the whole of humanity in the name of a so-called spiritual adventure. Let's sign on. And finally, something very recent from last week's newspaper, in fact, yes, and from the man of the hour, Thomas Piketty. Yeah. <laughs> he writes, he's an economist, a French economist, yeah. <laughs> His book is sold out, that you have, we have to wait for the second, the second printing now. He says, this was in a manifesto written by him and uh, a number of other economists and published last week. He says, debate over Europe's political institutions has all too often been pushed aside as technical or secondary. But refusing to discuss the organization of democracy ultimately means accepting the omnipotence of market forces and competition and abandoning all hope that democracy can regain control of 20th century capitalism. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of things. Well, this last one, uh, yeah, this about, uh, yeah, this reconquering this, uh, what he said again? Debate over Europe's political institutions has all too often been pushed aside as technical or secondary. But refusing to address the organization of democracy ultimately means accepting the omnipotence of market forces and competition and abandoning all hope that democracy can regain control of 20th century capitalism. I mean, the reason why I included that as the last of these, as the last yeah, of these four of quotes is because we've had a discussion over the past two days about the idea of Europe, of course, and about the sense of Europe. And for the most part, that discussion has taken a, a tone having to do with Europe in relation to what is not Europe. Europe in relation to what is outside of Europe, uh, or Europe in relation to itself in a sort of self-reflective, almost in the, in the sense that Sartre, Sartre mentions here. Mm -hmm. yeah? What values do we, does Europe embody? What cultures, do we, cultural traits do we share, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think Piketty gives a, a sort of wake-up call, but it's a sort of wake-up call that I think we find in Patochka as well, actually, 
and it's, it's a wake-up call about time, unless we start to talk very concretely, unless, and perhaps unless philosophers, and that's a question whether we're capable as mm -hmm. philosophers to contribute something to that, whether we start okay. to talk very concretely okay. about the structure of institutions and about the, the nature of our democracy, then in a, in a sense the battle is already, the battle for Europe, shall we say, has already been lost. Okay, yeah, uh, I share this, uh, this feelings, of course. Uh, I can just think of this last quotation, which is a quite incredible, this idea of democracy can regain control of 21st century capitalism. Isn't it incredibly rhetoric? So it's a, uh, I try to think at Patushka. He, the, all the things I quoted today, well, the um, super civilization and the other texts about negative Platonism, Platonism were written in the 50s. In particular, super civilization was uh, ended um, around 1955. In that year, the uh, Warsaw Pact was signed, and in Prague, the construction of the biggest monument to Stalin was just started. So it was maybe the harshest moment of uh, Czechoslovakian history after Second World War. The other texts from the 70s so, uh, were written in German by Patoczka, so in the try to be understandable. He wanted to write all the things about post Europe in Germany because he had this uh, pressure to be read and understand from the biggest public, po big possible public. But in that situation, he was incredibly alone and uh, uh, isolated. He was uh, first out from the university in 1972, and uh, he could never have more contact with people than uh, uh, these private seminars with uh, five or six people. So, and we're speaking, speaking about a guy who is waiting for the second edition of his bestseller. So um, I have, um, it's very problematic for me to create an interaction between, between this kind of guy and uh, who actually Patochka represented, I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, as uh, we already said in other occasions, we should also have the strength and the courage as well. And this is a brave struggle to use uh, uh, concepts conceived in such a different political and ethical situation also for problems who are our problems at the moment. So the paper you wrote recently about the concept of epoche, I think it goes in that uh, direction. So using a concept that Patushka dealt with um, without too many concerns about uh, the situation in which Patushka wrote it, but using that particular category in front of the biggest uh, uh, problems that uh, the present times um, present to us. So, in this sense, yes, I think that a debate on these uh, problems is absolutely urgent, also in a rhetoric sense, if we can't avoid it. But uh, yeah, and uh, maybe this conference but is. A do you think that? Do you think that uh, the philosophical discourse, and particularly the, the discourse around Patochka, the, that that has, to a large extent, dominated what we've done here? Does that contribute something? You think, or? Well, I think so. Yeah, the the interest for. Uh, his philosophy and also in these uh, very last years for his political philosophy as well can be interpreted in that way. I had a big argument last week during a presentation of my book in Milan and uh, this is the last thing I say because I was um, speaking about this professor from the University of Milan who read my book. Uh, she's a very, very great philosopher. I, I love her. And, but she harshly criticized me. She's Laura Buella. I can uh, say the name, no problem. Uh, she harshly criticized me because I, according to her, in my book, I sketched uh, in a too easy way this link uh, from the ethical to the political in Patushka. She, she said, okay, Patushka was a classical European philosopher like Husserl, like Heidegger. So maybe Heidegger is a bit different, but <laughs> so, like Husserl, let's say. And uh, he represented in this, kind, in this way not uh, the politician who actually wanted to make uh, his hands dirty to actually change the things. At least he can represent an example for us, for the people, for the politicians as well. But there is always a, a rift between what uh, he was and what he said and the real political action. And a person from the public, we were in the Czech center of, uh, of Milan, a person of the public who was Czech and was also an historian and was also uh, a witness, he lived in Prague during uh, the 70s, I think, said uh, in a very correct way, um, well, but uh, Patochka, trying to conceive what uh, the parousia is, what uh, telling the truth is, in that situation was already a politician. 
So what uh, we intend uh, for uh, an absolute abstract philosophical thing, so for example, speaking about the concept of truth in that particular historical and political situation was already a political action. So there is no absolute no risk uh, to make this uh, too easy com link from ethical to political. In that case, uh, it already existed. Maybe we should uh, go back to conceive this sort of uh, tight bond. Anya? Yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, this, is, this is just an interesting conversation, but uh, two things. One is to connect two of your quotes, I think, that you're not connecting, but I would like to connect maybe. And also, just your last point about this um, sort of when a philosopher speaks truth, it becomes political. I mean, it makes me remind you very much of the essay Truth and Politics by Hannah Arendt. Of course. Specifically saying philosophers don't follow the polis unless the polis is so destroyed that it needs a philosopher to come up and simply speak truth to wake people up. All right. Let's thank Francesco. Thank you.